Um, we're going to give you some key principles that we're surrounding the liver, um, starting to introduce some topics about it. Some of you will know lots about the liver already. Some of you must be brand new. So we're just going to get straight into it. And for those who don't know us, just the brief intro, I'm Ben, I'm currently a medical registrar in London. And the other Ben with us today, uh, another founder of Pulse Notes, is a plastics registrar. Um, so crack on, ask any questions you want in the chat, guys, and we'll just get through. Okay, so let's get started. So we're going to start by looking at some of the anatomy of the liver, going to get a bit of an understanding as we work our way through towards physiology and a bit more of clinical relevance. So the liver is the largest internal organ in the abdominal cavity, and it weighs about 1.2 to 1.5 kilograms, obviously dependent on the size of the individual. And you can see here it's got two lobes. It's got the right lobe and the left lobe, and it's anatomically divided by a ligament known as the falciform ligament, which is highlighted. So on the posterior or inferior surface of the liver, we can see there's lots of different structures, and we can see that on the picture on the right. So the right lobe of the liver contains two smaller lobes known as the caudate lobe and the quadrate lobe. And we can see from the diagram there's lots of these impressions on the liver where the other organs press into it. We've got some vessels and we've got the gallbladder all sat on that inferior surface. There's lots of ligaments that surround the liver that help hold it in place in that area. So we have coronary ligaments that attach to the diagram superiorly. And we have the ligamentum teres, which is the umbilical vein remnant from when people are fetuses. And we can see that highlighted at the bottom. We then have some additional ligaments. So we have the triangular ligaments, which form in the corners of the coronary. And then we have um, a fissure area from the previous uh, ligamentum venosum, which shunts blood during the neonatal period. So looking at the surface anatomy, on the diagram on the right, you can see sort of the skeletal system and then the liver sort of plopped inside. What we have is the right superior border of the liver lies at the right fifth rib. And we can see that just about two centimeters or so next to the midclavicular line highlighted. And then the left superior border lies around the left sixth rib. Okay, again, by the midclavicular line. So it's quite, it's much higher up than we actually think when we're looking into a, a surface anatomy abdomen. And then the lower border passes obliquely from the ninth costal cartilage up to the eighth left costal cartilage. And we can see how it's situated there with the diaphragm around it. So it's quite a big structure that goes a long way across our abdomen. Okay, and you can see why this is the biggest structure within the abdominal cavity. So looking a bit deeper, so we said there was a right lobe, a left lobe, and on the inferior surface, that right lobe, there was a caudate lobe and a quadrate lobe. And actually, there are more segments, so we could say, or functional segments, as per the coronoid classification. And this divides the liver into eight functional segments. So each segment has its own blood supply. Um, going from the hepatic veins, has own blood supply from the portal vein and the hepatic artery. And this is important in surgical planning for determining where lesions are on imaging. So it just gives us a bit more of an understanding um, of the liver's sort of microanatomy detail. So it may be that if we've got a lesion in the seventh, that's the one we're going to be taking out. Okay, because if we, we have to take out the whole section because it has a blood supply to collectively. And it may be that in a right hepatectomy, when you take out the right lobe, you're taking out multiple of those functional segments. So it gives you a bit more understanding how we can see the liver in a bit more detail. We then have a very important structure known as the porta hepatis. So we can see that highlighted here in this circle. So the porta hepatis, so it's a deep fissure through which all the neurovascular structures enter the liver. So the three key structures going in is the hepatic artery comes off and, and then gives off the right and left hepatic arteries going through the port hepatis. We have the portal vein coming up, giving off its branches through the port hepatis. And then we also have the bile duct coming up to the common hepatic bile duct, then differentiating to the right and left. So all these key structures are going through the port hepatis on the undersurface of the liver. And with the portal vein, so... Importantly, the liver is one of the organs that has a dual blood supply, okay? It gets blood from the hepatic artery and also blood from the portal vein. So the portal system drains blood from the gastrointestinal tract. So it's really important as the first organ that's taking all that nutrients we're absorbing from the gut. And also for any medications that we're taking orally, they go to the liver first to be detoxified or broken down. And we can see that the portal vein is actually a combination of the superior mesenteric and the splenic 
and the inferior mesenteric goes up and joins the splenic vein, which then goes on to join to form the portal vein. That's a very common exam question is knowing which veins ultimately join to form the portal vein. Okay, so, and the portal venous system is essentially where you have from one capillary network to another is connected by a vein rather than traditionally going from artery capillary network vein. And then the liver, so this is where it can be, feel a little bit complex, but we'll try and break it down. So the liver is innervated by the celiac plexus, which receives fibers from the splanchnic nerves and the vagus nerves, okay? So the diagram here we see again, so this is the same diagram we used to show the porta hepatitis. You've got the stomach and the liver slightly faded. We then can see our blood supply, the aorta and hepatic artery, and the portal vein. Now we have our kind of our neurovascular or neurological structures here. So we've got the vagus nerves, which run along the anterior and posterior surface of the esophagus. Then part of the vagus nerve then gives us a branch going towards the celiac axis, celiac plexus, which sits above the celiac artery, which one of the first anterior branch of the aorta. So this gives the parasympathetic fibers to this plexus where the cell bodies are, which can then pass innervation to the liver. We then have the sympathetic chain, which then runs down. It gives off sympathetic fibers and into the abdominal cavity, it gives off these splanchnic nerves, okay? So the splanchnic nerves then go down and give the sympathetic innervation to the celiac plexus. And then from here, it can give both sympathetic from the splanchnic nerves and parasympathetic from the vagi going into the liver. And there are different plexus lower down. So there'll be a superior mesenteric plexus and inferior mesenteric plexus all following the course of the arteries. And generally the sympathetic nervous system will always follow the course of arteries. So now if we look in a bit more detail, so we've looked at sort of the macro structure, the macro anatomy of the liver. So if we look a little bit more in detail of the micro structure, okay. So the liver is divided into functional units called lobules. And lobules are these hexagonal structures that surround a central vein. So if we look on the left, we've got three hexagonal structures here. And in each one in the middle, there's a central vein. So a portal triad sits on each corner, as we can see highlighted on the left. And that contains the terminal branches of the hepatic artery, the portal vein and the bile duct. And essentially, we've got branches will run from the portal vein towards the central vein, and then blood is taken from the central vein through the hepatic veins and back up towards the heart. Bile runs in the opposite direction, going from bile canaliculi, which we'll see in a second, going up towards the portal triad, the bile duct, and then taken via larger bile ducts and empties into the duodenum. And what we can see from the left is we have these kind of zones that we talk about, with zone one, zone two, and zone three, which just describes the location in preference to whether it's around the central vein or whether it's more around the portal triad, okay? So zone three is perivenular around the central vein, whereas zone one is much closer to that portal triad. And this is the overall kind of microstructure. So if we look a bit in more detail, one of these hexagonal structures, we can see this diagram. Okay, so initially it looks a bit, there's lots of stuff going on. But essentially what we have here is we've got the main cells. So we've got hepatocytes and cholangiocytes, which are the principal liver cells. So the kind of brown cells we see here are our hepatocytes and they comprise 60% of the liver. And in the green cells, we have the cholangiocytes. So the hepatocytes line the sinusoids, which are essentially basically very small veins running from the portal vein down towards the central vein. And we can see how the hepatic artery branches join with that sinusoid down towards the central vein. And that's all lined by hepatocytes. These hepatocytes also on the surface line canaliculi, which are very, very small bile ducts because hepatocytes themselves are important in the secretion and formation of bile of which cholangiocytes then modify the bile. So it's actually hepatocytes that make it. Within this structure, we then have two more important cells we have Kupfer cells, which are like a type of macrophage that's important for immune defense within the liver, for phagocytosing things, keeping everything under control. But then a small space between the endothelial cells of that sinusoid and the hepatocytes, known as the space of Dissi. And then we have these stellate cells, which are situated just on the surface of hepatocytes 
and they're in the pathophysiology of liver disease. They're in, they're involved in the deposition of extracellular matrix, which essentially means they deposit lots of connective tissue, which can lead to fibrosis and scarring. And it's thought that these cells are important in the fibrotic development that occurs in many different liver diseases. So kind of in summary here, the main thing is we have hepatocytes, which line everything important in the formation of bile, important in the formation of altering, that's the interacting with the sinusoid blood. And then we have cholangiocytes, which line the latter part of the canicli leading to the bile ducts, so important for the modification of bile. And finally, before we take a break, we're just going to look now at the functions of the liver. So what are the key things? The liver does loads of stuff in the body. But what key things can we summarize that the liver does? So in broad terms, the liver is involved in metabolic processes. It's needed to detoxify substances and to break down substances or degrade. It's important in the synthesis of molecules. It's involved in the storage of a number of uh, substances. It's needed for bile formation. And it's involved in the secretion of certain hormones. Okay, so a wide range. So let's look at each one of these in a little bit more detail. So we know that the liver processes glucose, lipids and protein following absorption. And it's critical in the metabolism of lots of these macromolecules. Okay. With detoxifying and degrade, it's important for the breakdown of waste products from metabolism within the body. It's also important for the breakdown of medications that, or foreign molecules that we ingest to make them less toxic and be able to be excreted. And it's also needed to break down hormones once they've been functionally active to make sure they don't continue to be active in the body. It's involved in the synthesis of plasma proteins, such as albumin, which are important for binding certain molecules in the blood and for maintaining an oncotic pressure. And it's also needed for the creation of acute phase proteins, such as C-reactive protein, which rises in inflammatory states and is needed um, to sort of help fight against bacteria. It's involved in the storage of glycogen, fats, vitamins, and inorganic molecules like copper and iron. And with bile, with bile formation, that's needed to facilitate lipid metabolism and also to eliminate waste products such as bilirubin. And we're going to focus a lot on bile formation later. And with hormones, it involves the secretion of things like thrombopoietin, which is a potent stimulant to platelet formation. It's involved in the secretion of hepcidin, which regulates iron absorption from the gut. And also things such as insulin like growth factor, which are part of our normal sort of metabolism and the growth hormone pathway. So a really wide ranging effect of function the liver has. So we can see why there's such a significant problem when the liver is failing or not working as well. We looked at the anatomy, we looked at the microstructure of the liver, and we started to introduce concepts of hepatocytes, cholangiocytes, what they do, what they look like, the portal triad. So we then looked at the multiple functions there are in the liver and we see there's lots of different functions. Actually, each one of those functions could be a whole lecture in itself going over the intricacies of what it does and how it does that. What we're really going to focus on mainly is bile production and then how we break down lots of waste products goes into the bile because that links into bilirubin and, and what we actually measure clinically in blood tests and how we manage liver disease. So let's really focus on bile. So hepatocytes secrete bile acids, bile pigments and cholesterol, and they secrete these into the canaliculi, and this creates bile, which we then know the cholangiocytes modify, and it goes through the bile ducts, it can be stored in the gallbladder, and it's secreted into the intestines via the second part of the duodenum as during normal digestion. So we said bile is modified by cholangiocytes as it's transported through bile ducts and it's essentially absorption and digestion of fats by a process known as emulsification and we've got a diagram of that in a second. So bile salts absorb on the surface of fat droplets which increases the surface area of which pancreatic lipase which is the main enzyme that breaks down fats secreted by the pancreas can act to enable the breakdown of fats so we can absorb them and use them within the body. So this is the process of emulsification. We have a large fat globule, which is developed from our ingestion of food. 
We then have our bile salts, which are secreted within the bile during the time of a meal. What we can see is these bile salts, then they're able to break up the fat globules into smaller ones by surrounding it. The hydrophobic component and the hydrophilic components then separated. And this is important for then pancreatic lipase to come on and then act. So bile salts are the most important component of bile, which are usually derived from cholesterol. Okay, And the other components of bile usually are things such as cholesterol itself, a kind of alkaline rich fluid. We have the bile salts, of which there are different ones, and then bile pigments such as bilirubin. Okay, And there's other components such as phospholipids, inorganic salt, electrolytes, there's lots of little things. But the main thing is the bile salts. And what happens is because they're so important, we want to recycle these bile salts. And so rather than hepatocytes having to create loads and loads of bile salts continually, what we can do is we create them. They go through the intestines and then in the terminal ileum, we can reabsorb them back into the circulation, back towards the liver to then be utilized again. So that prevents us from having to expend a significant amounts of energy within hepatocytes, creating more bile salts. Okay, so about 95% of bile salts are reabsorbed in the terminal ileum, go back to the liver, whereas only 5% are then excreted in the stool. Okay, and this system is the enterohepatic circulation. What goes in through the intestines goes back up towards the liver and so on. So any disease of the terminal ileum or resection, so removing the terminal ileum, can lead to the malabsorption of bile salts because that's the location where we reabsorb them to go back through the enterohepatic circulation. So we contain about three to four grams of bile salts in the body, but during a meal, about three to 15 grams enters the duodenum. So this means there's a really efficient recycling of bile salts by the enterohepatic circulation, which allows the more and more secretion to happen to help with the emulsification of fats, which allows absorption and digestion. So if we can't reabsorb these bile salts because of disease in the terminal ileum, it can predispose to gallstones and it can cause chronic watery diarrhea. So essentially with gallstones, there needs to be a balance between the components in bile. So if we get an imbalance, so too much cholesterol, not enough bile salts, it can predispose to gallstone disease. That's one component. If we can't absorb bile salts, it then basically causes a watery diarrhea. And one of the classical things we see is that if someone's had a previous right hemicolectomy, so the right side of the colon's removed with part of the terminal ileum, then we lose some of our absorbed capacity for bile salts which can lead to bile salt malabsorption. Also any disease that affects the terminal ileum, such as Crohn's disease, we can get a malabsorption of bile leading to bile salt malabsorption. And that's this chronic watery diarrhea. So if someone presents with persistent watery diarrhea, who's previously had disease or has known disease of the terminal ileum, it may be bile salt malabsorption. And in these cases, we need to treat these patients with medications that bind to bile salts within the intestine preventing them from inducing this diarrhea, which usually resolves the problem. Okay, so things such as cholestyramine, covicevalam are bile salt binding resins, which help to prevent this bile salt malabsorption picture. So we looked at how bile is really important in the emulsification of fats and digestion, but bile is also needed for the excretion of waste products through the biliary system, okay? So bilirubin is a bile pigment and it's a waste product from the breakdown of erythrocytes. So it's a like, movement into bile is important to get rid of this waste product. So we turn over lots of red cells all the time for our lifetime. So we're creating lots of bilirubin that we need to be able to get rid of. And the bile system is there for that purpose. So bilirubin is the end product of heme metabolism, which is the heme found within hemoglobin, which is found in red blood cells, which is the oxygen carrying molecule important for for uh, respiration. So around 300 milligrams of bilirubin is formed each day, we need to be able to remove this. So elevated levels of bilirubin. So if we can't take bilirubin to the liver, process it, put it into the bile, we get elevated levels of bilirubin. And this is the substance which leads to the jaundice color due to deposition. And we see it predominantly in the skin and also in the sclera, so the white of the eyes. So how do we process this bilirubin? So initially we have hemoglobin, which is then we break down heme and globin. 
So the globin chains are broken down and recycled, and then we're left with the heme part of the hemoglobin molecule. By the action of hemoglobin, heme oxygenase enzyme, heme is converted into biliverdin, and we give off iron and carbon monoxide, the sort of waste products. This so the iron can be recycled and used. Biliverdin is then broken down into bilirubin by biliverdin reductase. And we then have this molecule bilirubin with the unconjugated form of bilirubin. This is then taken via binding to albumin because it's insoluble, so it won't dissolve in water, is then taken to the liver bound to albumin. Okay, so this is the initial process. So heme is broken down, biliverdin goes to bilirubin by biliverdin reductase, then binds to albumin is taken to the liver. So then we have the liver part, what's happening in the liver to get it into the bile. So initially, unconjugated bilirubin, which is insoluble, is conjugated. So something is stuck onto the side of bilirubin to make it soluble. And the enzyme that processes this conjugation is gluconyltransferase. Okay. We then have a conjugated bilirubin, which is soluble. And this is transferred from the hepatocytes into the bile, into the bile canalic line through the bile ducts. And this excretion process is done via some membrane proteins such as MRP2. When it's then put into the small intestines, it then gets acted on by bacterial enzymes and it can be broken down or formed into different substances such as urobilinogen. There's then three pathways a urobilinogen can take. Either it can be recycled through the enterohepatic circulation, go back to the liver. It can be excreted via the kidneys as urobilin or urobilinogen or it's excreted in the feces as urobilin or stercobilin. So stercobilin is the reason that we have the sort of color of our feces. And this whole process is there's multiple steps we can see. So what, if we have problems in this process, so if we have a defect in gluconyl transferase, or there's a problem in the MRP2, we can see that we're not gonna be able to get rid of that bilirubin by the normal pathway, and we're gonna to lead to an elevated bilirubin levels and we can lead to jaundice. And that's what we see in some inherited conditions. So there's your, these two conditions, Gilbert syndrome and Kruglinagier syndrome. So both autosomal recessive. So in both of these conditions affect the same enzyme, gluconyl transferase, leading to failed conjugation of bilirubin so we get elevated levels of unconjugated bilirubin. In Gilbert syndrome, we get a very, it's very common. We get a very mild elevation in unconjugated bilirubin, usually during a concurrent illness. So if someone's got an infection, they're dehydrated and well, for whatever reason, we may get an isolated rise in unconjugated bilirubin, doesn't cause any problems. Kruglinage, there's different types, usually presents more in childhood neonatal period with a more severe unconjugated um, bilirubin rise but we're not going to go any further here just to show you that actually lots of times in the body and physiology, we have these enzyme pathways. There is normally some inherited condition that will affect one of these enzymes leading to problems. Okay. And then the same can be said for if we have an enzymatic defect in MRP2. So this is a protein we needed to excrete bilirubin from the hepatocytes into the bile. If we have a defect in it, such as this condition called Dubin Johnson syndrome, we can't excrete bilirubin into the canaliculi. So therefore we get dangerously elevated levels here of conjugated bilirubin. We're able to do the first step, there's no problem with gluconyl transferase, but the second step, the excretion, there's a problem, so we get elevated levels of hyperconjugated hypobilirubinemia. And this is the problem again, in early childhood we get significant problems with jaundice. Okay, and again this is just showing you how even just this simple um, enzymatic pathway for bilirubin, there's already loads of clinically relevant syndromes related to enzyme defects from inheritance. So as we saw, that's the whole pathway. So if there's a problem in that pathway, going from the hemoglobin molecule to the final excretion of bilirubin and stercobilin in the stool, we're going to lead to elevated levels of bilirubin and that causes the jaundice, the typical yellow featuring of hepatic disease. So we can classify jaundice into prehepatic, hepatic and post-hepatic. So with prehepatic, there's usually some kind of increased bilirubin load. So more bilirubin is going to the liver to be processed. And that's typically 
from chronic hemolytic conditions. So something like sickle cell, thalassemia, hereditary spherocytosis, all these hemo hem hemolytic disorders increase the bilirubin load because more red blood cells are being turned over and broken down. So more has to be processed. So we get an elevation in unconjugated bilirubin. And also conditions like Gilbert syndrome, where we have a reduced activity of this enzyme needed for the conjugation of bilirubin, we may see elevated levels of unconjugated bilirubin. And that's often put in the prehepatic sort of components of this jaundice classification. With hepatic, as usually some form of liver damage leads to the reduced excretion. So the hepatocytes aren't working as, as well. So that process from conjugation to then excretion into canalicula isn't working. So we get elevated levels of conjugated bilirubin. And any form of liver damage or any problem that leads to liver damage can cause a kind of hepatic picture of jaundice with elevated conjugated bilirubin. And then with post-hepatic, there's usually some form of obstruction. So whether it's at the bile ducts or whether it's lower down in the main bile duct leading to the duodenum, there's some form of obstruction. And that leads that means the bile can't be secreted, more bilirubin is reabsorbed within that biliary system. And then that leads to the classical pale stools and dark urine because that biliary pigment isn't going into the stools to change it to that brown color. And as the more conjugate bilirubin is reabsorbed and goes through into the urine, it gives it a darker color. And classically, post-hepatic causes of jaundice are usually a cancer, duct disease, or some form of stone. Okay, so they're the three main things. And this is how we can really think about any per patient presenting with jaundice. Do we think it's prehepatic, hepatic, or post-hepatic? So we then that then led to us saying, right, one of the key features of liver disease is elevated bilirubin levels because something is not functioning properly, and how we could divide that into prehepatic, hepatic, and post-hepatic. So bilirubin is one of the things that we can measure as part of the liver function test, okay? And this is a group of blood tests or group of enzymes within blood tests that we can do to try and determine whether the liver disease is present, okay? We're now gonna focus on what LFTs are and how we use them in clinical practice to determine what the cause of liver disease is. So liver function tests, they're a blood test, so a single blood test, and it's used to detect and determine the cause of liver disease. So is liver disease present or do we think it's present? And if it is, what is the cause of that liver disease? So liver function tests basically refer to a series of enzymes that can be measured in the blood. And they're released due to a variety of insults and we use them to assess for liver injury. So interpretation of LFTs enables us to determine the type of liver injury. So predominantly whether it's hepatic, so a problem with the hepatocytes, or cholestatic, so a problem with the bile up cholangiocytes picture. Okay, so that's what we think about. Is this a hepatic problem or is this a cholestatic problem affecting the cholangiocytes and the bile ducts? So these are the, so when you do LFTs, you get four main enzymes and you also get bilirubin. We're gonna shell bilirubin for a second, okay? So these four main enzymes you get are alanine aminotransferase, so ALT, you can get aspartate aminotransferase, AST. You can get alkaline phosphatase, so ALP. And you can get gamma glutamyl transferase, GGT. Okay. And usually the lab will choose to provide one of ALT or AST rather than both, but you can ask for both if needed. So these are the four enzymes. So these are all released during some form of injury to the liver, and we can measure them in the blood. So with ALT, so it's a cytosolic enzyme, it's involved in gluconeogenesis. It can also be found in other tissues, such as the kidney, the heart, the muscle, but it's more liver specific than AST. So with ALP, it's another cytosolic enzyme. It can also be found in placenta, ileum, kidney, bone, but over 80% measured in the blood will be coming from the liver or bone. AST, so it's a cytosolic and mitochondrial enzyme. It's in found in two locations. It's in a wide range of tissues, okay, including the liver. And again, it's also involved in gluconeogenesis like ALT is. And finally, gamma GT, so it's a membrane bound enzyme. It's got its highest concentration within the bile ducts and isolated rises can be seen with alcohol ingestion, okay. 
So essentially, we have these enzymes, which are part of the normal functioning of hepatocytes, of bile ducts, of cytes, which are released for certain types of injury. But as we can see, they're also found in other tissues. So ALP can also be found in bone predominantly, and ALT and AST can be found in other areas, such as muscle, kidneys, heart. So we can see that it's, they're not highly specific to one tissue in the body. So we have to interpret multiple of them together to work out whether this is true liver disease. So the key thing here is despite their name, the enzymes measured in LFTs are not markers of synthetic liver function, okay? They are just bystanders of liver injury. So the liver is injured. Because it's injured, these enzymes are released into the blood and we can measure them. But it doesn't monitor their synthetic function of the liver. So when we're thinking about synthetic function of the liver, so how well the liver is actually functioning and able to carry out its normal metabolic or homeostatic properties, those functions are related to bilirubin, iron, iron, albumin. Okay, so for the liver, so the liver has to be functioning properly to be able to process bilirubin through that system, so conjugating it, then excrete it into the bile. That whole system has to be working properly for bilirubin to be processed. So if bilirubin starts to become elevated, either there's a blockage to it being secreted and it's getting reabsorbed, or the liver is just not working and it's not able to process it. One of the main functions of the liver earlier, we said was creating proteins. And one of the things it creates a lot of clotting factors. So if the synthetic function of the liver is not working, it's not creating the normal proteins it does, like clotting factors, we get a derangement in the INR. Okay, we get a high INR. So that suggests that the intrinsic synthetic function of the liver is not working. And again, albumin is a classic plasma protein the liver creates that take, is an active process. So therefore, if the synthetic function of the liver is off because it's been severely injured, albumin will not be creating, it'll be low. So in mild hepatic injury, you may get a rise in the liver enzyme suggesting some kind of injury but actually the capacity of the liver to still function is there, so you won't get coexisting derangement in these synthetic functions. Conversely, you may get a very severe liver injury with dramatic elevation enzymes and also derangement in these synthetic functions because not only has the liver been injured, it's been injured so badly it cannot carry out its normal synthetic function. So that's the key thing, so enzymes, are just bystands of injury, synthetic function is how the liver is actually functioning and managing to perform its normal uh, activity. So now let's look at the interpretation. So this is gonna be a broad brush interpretation and we're leading on to some questions and how we can interpret LFTs. So it's the pattern of LFT derangements can be used to determine the cause of liver injury. So LFT should always be interpreted with synthetic function as we talked about. So severe liver injury, such as acute liver failure, decompensated cirrhosis, is associated with high bilirubin, low albumin and coagulopathy. So that suggests the synthetic function is not working and that's a concerning component. So with hepatic injury, so predominant damage to hepatocytes, we see a predominant rise in the aminotransferase. So AST or ALT, whichever one is measured or both, if both are measured. And when we have a significant rise in these amino transferase enzymes, we generally refer to it as a transaminitis. Then we use usually an associated rise in gamma GT, and there may or may not be a slight rise in ALP, but the predominant rise is AST or ALT. And it's important to remember that other pathologies can cause a rise in AST or ALT, such as rhabdomyolysis, which is a skeletal muscle breakdown. Because we know these enzymes are also found in muscle, we may see a significant rise in those kind of conditions, okay? But usually, first principle, we think, if there's a significant transaminitis, is there something going on with the liver? With cholestatic injury, so a rise in ALP is typical of cholestatic liver injury, such as some disease with the bile ducts or some obstruction to the bile ducts. So a concurrent rise in gamma GT indicates it's hepatobiliary origin. Okay, so that's usually, so the first principle is, we've got a rise in ALP. Could this be bone or could this be liver? Because we know that predominantly ALP will rise in the body because of bone disease or liver disease. If there's also a significant rise in gamma GT, it suggests that it's from hepatobiliary origin as the rise in ALP. 
in this picture, there may also be a small rise in the amino transferases AST and ALT, but the predominant picture is that rise in ALP. So if we get isolated rises in ALP without gamma GT, it usually means one of two things. Either this is some kind of bony disease and ALP is being released because we have lots of metastatic lesions in bone, for example, or there's some kind of infiltrative liver disease. So something like lots of iron deposition in the liver, there's lots of amyloid deposition in the liver, there's lots of metastatic deposition in the liver. Some kind of disease infiltrating the liver may lead to a predominant ALP rise. But the first principle here is cholecystic liver injury, ALP rise, is there a coexisting gamma GT rise? So now we're going to do some very brief cases, just showing how you can try and interpret those um, LFTs to come to a diagnosis. Okay, and these are kind of easing into them. And obviously, there's more complexity as you go further through training. But in this kind of first case, let's say we've got a 34 year old who presents with abdominal pain and jaundice. And we've got the LFTs on the right side. So we've got a bilirubin is LFT. The ALT is significantly elevated, over 1,000. ALP is minimally elevated. The albumin's okay. Amylase is okay. And then the gamma GT is partially, it's quite elevated as well. So I'll just let you look at those for a second and see what pattern is going on here with this patient. Okay, so we'll give, him a, we'll give you a minute or so just to have a look through all of that. So, based on those LFTs, what do you think the most likely diagnosis is? Okay, is it acute viral hepatitis? Is it just someone with cirrhosis? Is it gallstones? Is it a pancreatic tumour or is it haemolytic anemia? Cool. Yeah, if you just want to put your answers in the uh, chat, everyone. Uh, so we've got a spread really, Ben. Alcoholic liver disease. Uh, someone's gone for hepatitis, uh, gallstones, cirrhosis, pancreatic tumor. I mean, literally all of them. Uh, <laughs> so this this is good. This is you want to we want spread. A. We want to spread so we can say why certain things are not okay. So this is a typical example of acute viral hepatitis. Okay. So the reason for this is, if we looked at the LFTs, it was predominantly an amino transferase rise. So the ALT, AST was over a thousand. Okay, so that's something hepatocellular going on. There was a small rise in gamma GT, a small rise in ALP, but actually the predominant picture here was the amino transferase rise. So this is predominantly a hepatocellular problem. And from this list, the main here thing here that can cause an acute hepatitis or acute hepatocellular injury is viral hepatitis, okay? Gallstones, pancreatic tumor, they're more likely to cause a kind of cholestatic injury. Hemolytic anemia shouldn't cause any derangement in the LFTs really because it's just causing a rise in bilirubin. And then cirrhosis, usually there'll be, unless there's significant decompensation and an injury on top of cirrhosis, the LFTs are usually relatively normal in patients with compensated stable cirrhosis. Ben, you're able just to go back and show the blood results again. There we go. Yeah. So we can see this here, the predominant problem here is the ALT is over a thousand. That is the most markedly abnormal problem compared to all the other ones. So that's, we're looking here for a hepatocellular injury. Perfect. Okay. And so, our kind of top tip here is if you've got a transaminitis, a significant transaminitis, so we're saying something over a thousand international units per liter, there's four main conditions that are associated with this marked amount of transaminitis. Okay, it's either acute viral hepatitis, ischemic hepatitis, paracetamol overdose, or autoimmune hepatitis. Okay, so some of these conditions you'll know about, some of this will be the first time you're coming across. But the principle is these are the four main conditions which can all cause a significantly elevated transaminitis in the blood. People just asking um, the 
gamma GT was quite raised. Is that also quite typical of a, a hepatitis picture? Yeah, so gamma GT, any form of liver injury, it will be raised, okay. Um, it can be, the, the, there's variability in how much it's raised. I think with gamma GT, really, you're, it, the most important is when you're trying to interpret a predominant rise in ALP, that's when the gamma GT is really important. Here, it's very obvious that the transamylitis is the main problem. It's over a thousand, that's the issue. That's what we're focusing on. If the transamylitis was very mildly elevated, and then we had this predominant ALP, we're then looking at the gamma GT to say, look, what's going on here? Is this making it kind of hepatobiliary liver origin? Perfect. Someone's actually put, would it be more likely to be hepatitis A or E, uh, Ben? So interesting question. So hepatitis E is the most common cause of hepatitis now. There's lots of, but hepatitis E predominantly uh, is most likely to cause a mild transaminitis around 300, 400, but it can cause over a thousand. Um, whereas acute hepatitis B, acute hepatitis A, that's will cause usually causes a significant transaminitis if it's over, uh, if it presents acutely. And this is a really good question, actually. How long after a paracetamol overdose do you get liver injury that's recordable to this extent? Uh, usually relatively quickly. Um, it's because usually even I don't know the, the actual time frame is very difficult to say. But, you know, we say if someone's had a significant insult of paracetamol within days, you're going to have a massive rise. And then you're slowly what you're seeing is then a worsening of synthetic function because you're taking a big hit. There's a big injury. You see a rise in transaminolysis. And then you're slowly seeing the synthetic function getting worse. So INR is going off, albumin is going down. And that's as you're going more and more into days. Yeah. But I suppose converse to that, you, you may not see it immediately, say within the first few hours of um, taking over days. Yeah, exactly. And that's why if you're treating anyone with paracetamol, you give them their therapy, which can take up to, you know, you give them their bags, which take up to 20 hours or so. And then at the end of that therapy, you're then repeating the blood test to see what's changed over that, that kind of 24 hour, hour period. Perfect. I think you've got some more cases, haven't you, Ben? Yeah. So next one. So 68 year old presents with painless jaundice, dark urine and pale stools. And then this is the blood test. Okay, so this is the LFTs on the right. We've got bilirubin that's 150, an ALT that's 140, an ALP up at 450, albumin amylase are okay, and the gamma GT is 469. I'll just let you have a look at that for a second. Okay, with that in mind, what do we think the most likely diagnosis is? So, uh, pancreatic CA, cholestatic injury, gallstones, pancreatic CA, a lot of Ds, a couple of Cs. Okay. So what's most important there is what everyone's now looking at and now what everyone's alluding to is what we've got is we've got a predominant cholestatic injury because the main issue here really if we're looking at it is the bilirubin's really up which could be anywhere from hepatic post hepatic but if we're looking at the LFT enzyme it's the ALP which is a predominantly raised with a raised gamma GT saying okay this is something cholestatic going on here okay so we know it's cholestatic so then when we're looking at the, the test we're saying okay pointing out here the main kind of cholestatic problems are probably gallstones or pancreatic tumor then we take that in the context of the brief history to say okay it's a 68 year old so older so cancer is more in play here but it could still be gallstones they have kind of typical cholestatic picture in the fact they have dark urine and pale stools because there's some kind of obstruction to biliary flow and then in the context of a painless jaundice that's when we think okay this is probably a pancreatic tumor so this is our top tip. So painless jaundice. So painless jaundice is concerning for a tumor at the head of the pancreas in older patients. Okay. And it's usually associated with other features of structured jaundice, such as dark urine, pale stools. Okay. So this is a classic exam question. This is a finals case. This is, could be a kind of OSCE-ISCI case. It's that 
elderly patient who comes in with constitutional symptoms of malignancy and now has a painless jaundice, your first thought process always have to be, is this malignancy? And that's what we need to rule out first, okay? We shouldn't be jumping to gallstones or any other cholestatic rare condition until we first ruled out that this is cancer. So I think this is the last one. So finally, we've got a 41 year old who presents with abdominal pain and fever. And then we've got their LFTs on the right side. So the bilirubin is mildly elevated to 45. The ALT is mildly elevated to 120. ALP is up at 340. Again, we've got the albumin and the amylase are normal and the gamma GT is elevated at 290. So we'll just take a second to look at those. So what do we think the diagnosis is here? So we're getting a lot of C's. A lot of C's. Okay. So if we break it down, this is it's very similar to the question previously. If a very similar kind of LFT derangement, maybe just not as much of the high bilirubin. But this time, looking at the brief context, there's a younger patient, there's pain and there's fever. So this makes it more likely to be gallstones. Okay. So as a tip, so gallstones characteristically cause bitter colic, which is a kind of crampy right upper quadrant pain, which can come in waves or it can crescendo up to a peak and then gets worse over kind of four hours. Obstruction due to gallstones can lead to cholestatic LFTs. So we get a predominant ALP rise with gamma GT. If anyone has a fever, it's concerning for cholecystitis or cholangitis, cholecystitis being inflammation of the gallbladder, whereas cholangitis being inflammation and infection of the whole biliary tree. And it's important that we exclude gallstone pancreatitis in these patients with abdominal pain. So we need to do an amylase or a lipase because anyone who develops gallstone pancreatitis needs to have a semi-urgent cholecystectomy to get rid of their gallbladder. Perfect. So we'll just summarize there what we've done today. And then we will take some questions at the end. Anyone or anyone has any comments that we can go over. So we looked at the liver today, part of our uh, fundamental series or foundation series going over some of those key organs. So with the liver, we looked at the anatomy and how the liver is the largest internal organ located in the abdominal cavity and how it's divided into these multiple functional segments. We looked at the microstructure of the liver and how the hepatocytes and cholangiocytes are the main cells and they line branches of the portal vein, hepatic artery and bile ducts. And we talked about the role of the stellate cells and Kupfer cells. We looked at the physiology of the liver and we really focused on bile formation and how bile helps to emulsify fats and excrete waste products such as bilirubin and how that contributes significantly to the determination of types of liver disease. And finally, we looked at LFTs, how their liver function tests used to assess and determine the cause of liver injury. And they differ from the overall synthetic function of the liver, which includes bilirubin, INR and albumin. Okay, so thanks for joining us on this Sunday morning, guys. Always a pleasure. And you've got the dream team of Ben and Ben. <laughs>